Portfolio Builder members, welcome to our Thursday Trade Alert where we trade the TLT ETF. We hit almost the maximum return week over week where we would have been cut off at 143 on the TLT. As of closing out the trade, we're at 142.60. This is on a portfolio of 3,700 shares for a profit of $6,475. Now, this is relatively half our portfolio. The other half is in the SPY, and it's quite a wild day today. I'm just gonna jump to a few screens from my live stream and I'll review uh, today's trade alert. Uh, but we were sitting on almost the maximum profit on our SPY trade overnight in the futures market. You can see the SPY was trading at uh, close to 300 where we sold our call, and then we had a bunch of drama this morning. Uh, and continuing as the, uh, over in Capitol Hill, they're going over the whistleblower and talking about impeachment. So we'll jump back on that. The other big headline uh, that perhaps is even <clears throat> more significant was talks about Huawei not having an extension despite the Chinese purchasing agricultural products. So we'll jump into my live stream uh, news feed in a minute. I just wanted to... Uh, quickly jump into that. Uh, so again, our portfolio is designed to be weatherproof so that we can be hit with unexpected news flow that can be very negative to various parts of the economy and it doesn't turn into a huge loss in our portfolio. And today and this week has been a great example of that. We had the Fed lower rates, talk about organic growth of the balance sheet, which made us very bullish on the SPY and then we keep getting hit with uh, political news that continues to hold the SPY back. And we saw uh, that the SPY ETF is ready to rip past that $300 price point, uh, but the political drama and trade tensions with China continue to weigh heavy on it. So we'll take a close look at that, uh, but you can see overall uh, the strategy is working well and we're near our 1% return target in September. Let's take a look at the previous trade on TLT. You can see last Thursday, our trade alert was to sell to open the 143 call and to buy to open the 138 put. It's called a caller trade. This is a loose caller. That means we think the TLT could travel up significantly higher and we're only using the call options to finance the cost of our put option. So the best case scenario for us was TLT was at 143 today, and we were close to that. Uh, and the worst case for us would be if the TLT plummeted below 138, we would still get $138 a share because we constantly have a put option protecting our portfolio. So that was given out at noon Eastern last Thursday. Now it's noon Eastern the following week. And to get out of that trade, here's your instructions. You'll buy to close the 143 call and sell to close the 138 put. Now if you want today's new trade alert, you're going to have to be either in an active free trial or become a paid member. So if you're expired, you'll get to see the results of the trade alerts, you'll get this live stream, but you won't see the new trade alerts that we're issuing as we put them out. Quick little recap of what we do and then we'll jump into market forecasts and plans for the portfolio. 99% client success rate, no other advisory has even a 10% success rate. That's because we have very specific trading times that makes it very easy for our investors to know when to be ready to place trades. These are extremely easy on the go daily retirement income trade alerts. Dean says it takes 30 seconds a day, but who's counting? My dad says it takes less time for him to take out the trash. And I ask you, why make investing so complex? Don't you have better things to do with your most precious asset, your time? My promise to you is I will protect your assets and show you how to pick the low hanging fruit. Our put options hanging right below the SPY and TLT ETF make it impossible to lose very much money, period. Our goal is to create income and safety, not growth or speculation. Our target return on investment is only 1% to 2% a month. 
and we've only had one losing month of negative 1%. Our average has been 2%. If you watch this daily YouTube video, you'll know exactly the rhyme and reason of every single trade alert. Now, this is the best capital allocation that in the long run will give you the most diversification to your portfolio and the least drawdown. This has a hundred shares of the SPY on the Monday, Wednesday, Friday trade valued at approximately $30,000. 600 shares at SLV currently on our Tuesday trade. We do flip out the trade on Tuesday depending on what has the best outlook for uh, the next several weeks and then 300 shares of the TLT uh, with a value of approximately 45k plus on top of that a buy and hold position of $10,000 or 333 shares of GDX. Now remember if you go to Interactive Brokers by far the best brokerage dealer for this a $25,000 deposit will give you at least $100,000 in buying power so you can easily follow this. And because we always have put options under the SPY, SLV, and TLT, the maximum loss in any trading period is very controlled and very small. Now the, the catch is that because we have the put options and we're selling call options, that acts as a drag on our, on our potential return. So we're giving up potential growth for safety and income. Now if you want to skip the Tuesday trade, you can get started with a lot less capital, $66,000 to build this allocation right here and have the same balance. You'd have 100 shares of the SPY, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, noon Eastern, and 200 shares of the TLT for the Thursday play. So that still gives you a relatively equal balance in stocks and bonds and still a 10% allocation into the gold market. And we'll talk about why we're so bullish on gold in a minute. And if you want to start with even less capital, you want very high risk, high reward, then just take the Tuesday, Thursday trade, give up the SPY. You can get started with only $33,000, which means you could deposit very little in interactive brokers and have that kind of buying power. And once again, still a 10% position in GDX. So uh, if you want to follow the full program, here's your allocation a ratio of 1 to 3 on the SPY to TLT and a decent position in the SLV. If you want to skip Tuesday trades and only trade four days a week, this is a great setup right here. A 2 to 1 ratio of your TLT to SPY. And if you want to generate higher risk, higher reward, this setup does that uh, as the Tuesday trade will have greater volatility but it aims to achieve much higher returns. So those are your three options to follow our program. If you don't have the trade alert in your email, you just have the results of the previous week's trade, that means you need to call Dean right now at 505-322-7515. He's a great trader. He follows our program. He does his own options trading. He's made a lot of money in the markets. He can really help you get going here. A reminder, we do have a webinar coming up in 50 minutes for our free group. Yesterday was our paid... Uh, only webinar. This is where you can actually talk with me live. And if you haven't yet, subscribe to the channel and click the little bell so you can automatically get these notifications and listen to our content on the go. Okay, so let's take a look at our strategy, outlook, forecasts, and most recent trades. So as you can see here, the portfolio is designed to be weatherproof in almost all circumstances. We have a good allocation into the cryptocurrencies and precious metals. And for those of you who do follow the crypto, we only have 1% total allocation in Bitcoin, 1% in Ethereum. Those have delivered huge returns since we bought them back in December. Uh, the other 8% of that portfolio is in GDX. Now, if you don't like crypto, just go to a 10% allocation in GDX. You can see that the precious metal portfolio has performed the highest return, but it's using the least percentage of our assets. The Tuesday trade has outperformed the uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday trade, but you'll see it does have big swings to the upside and the downside, as that's its goal is to have a higher risk reward ratio. 
The SPY program is up 9%, and the bond portfolio uh, continues to deliver the most handsome returns this year, and it's been uh, almost nonstop profits for that. We've had very little losses in that portfolio. When you do overlap the strategies, you can see we had a 1.2% return in December, 2.2 in January, 1.7 in February, 2.7 in March, 1.2 in April, 2.2 in May, 3.2 in June, our only loss, negative one in July, 1.8 in August, and September is sitting at 0 0.7. So we need another uh, 30 basis points to get to our target of 1% uh, this month. And we'll see if the SPY can deliver that for us. It had overnight, uh, as you can see in this screenshot, we were up significantly. And then this morning, a lot of fear in the, in the stock market. So we'll jump into that in a minute. I have created a summary of the <clears throat> various trades we've pushed out most recently. Our Wednesday trade was up 17 cents when I took the TLT screenshots. The Tuesday trade is down 41 cents, but I'm not worried about that. Uh, that's our SLV, and we'll look at the potential for SLV in the next year or two as we see what's happening with the central banks. Most likely we'll be playing SLV for the next couple years and very reluctantly switching it out with other uh, ETFs or specific stocks. Uh, Monday trade, again, we were hit with the uh, impeachment fears and had a negative $1.97 loss on the SPY. Friday was down $0.34. Cents. Now, I do want to point out the SPY had uh, something like 13 trades without a loss as we had played it uh, from the last tariff hiccup that caused a sell-off in the SPY and I am still expecting the SPY to break beyond 300 and uh, into by November. So we'll take a look at that. Meanwhile our GDX is up 46 cents since a week ago and this is a buy and hold position where we're not doing the calls or puts. Okay so let's jump into the news. I've been listening to this all morning. Uh, we'll see what comes of it. We'll see if the House actually goes to a vote for impeachment or not. Uh, certainly the market's not liking this news whatsoever. We had comments that Huawei is not going to get relief, uh, which is interesting because um, we're seeing the Chinese actually purchase farming goods for once. After two years of dragging their feet and actually not buying goods, uh, they're finally coming out and making purchases. And this is all leading up to their anniversary on October 1st, uh, which is why I think we will potentially have a period of peace in the trade war and a breakout above that very tough resistance line on the SPY of 300. We'll take a look at the, the big picture as to why money wants to flow uh, into uh, to U.S. equities right now. <clears throat> Here is Daniel D. Booth with a, she used to work for the Fed, definitely a good person to follow. She says, can the U.S. permanently decouple from the rest of the world's big manufacturing nations as they slow or contract? That's clearly the message in risky assets. We can see a percentage of value added for each major economy uh, from manufacturing. And China and Germany have a huge percentage of their economy tied to that. And so that's why I like to watch Germany to predict uh, not only what's going to happen in the bond market, uh, but also to get a gauge of how much pain China is suffering at the time. The dollar index is at an all-time high this morning, uh, which is showing us that all the other currencies around the world are losing value. Uh, mainly the Japanese, Chinese, and Euro are all printing money, devaluing their currencies, lowering interest rates, uh, which is going to give the effect of making the relative value of the dollar higher, U.S. equities higher, gold higher, uh, and the U.S. treasuries, the only positive yielding uh, bond in a major developed economy that's currently available to investors. 
So this all points to up for pretty much all U.S. products right now, uh, as long as we don't get either trade war fear or impeachment fears, uh, which are currently, I believe, the only two things holding the SPY ETF back from a major breakout. Uh, as we saw in the futures market last night, it was almost touching that $300 line. Some t tweets from Trump. White House uh, released the whistleblower complaint. Here is probably the most important sign of a bull market in equities, and that's the money supply is so directly correlated to uh, the results of the equities market. And we're seeing all the central banks around the world start to uptick the money supply and lower rates. Now, normally they wait to do this after a stock market crash, uh, but we're in a unique situation where the PMIs in Germany just crashed below 40. Uh, really, the rest of the world's really suffering. And because they are lowering interest rates and starting to print money, and they're having a shortage of dollars to pay off all their debts, uh, we're seeing that our Fed is now lowering rates and, sure enough, increasing the balance sheet. So this is going to take pressure out of the bond market and allow capital to flow into, I believe, U.S. equities is a much better bet than really anything else. Italy's on the verge of bankruptcy. Germany is in a recession. Uh, China is at the risk of losing their manufacturing sector, which will cripple uh, their domestic side. Uh, so really, there's really no other place to invest right now. Uh, and at the same time, it seems there's a tremendous amount of money that is trapped into these negative yielding bonds, something like $16 trillion. It was $18 trillion, And they have no way out. So they really need the central banks to come in, pick up these bonds that have a guaranteed loss. It's pretty crazy that there's $16 trillion of negative bonds out there. If you hold those to uh, to the duration, you lose money. It's guaranteed. That's why it's a negative yielding bond. So nobody wants to hold them to, uh, to the finish line. They want to get out, and the central banks are going to have to pick up those losses and allow all these banks to get out of those positions. So I think that's what's underway right now and may help explain this repo madness we've been seeing so much about. Um, now, there are a lot of indicators saying that the forward-looking data could show a pickup in PMI's GDP growth uh, in the euro area and potentially in China as well. And that's because they're once again printing more money. Now, China's having problems with inflation. Their CPI is at three. So it's questionable just how much more debt they can put on their books without uh, starting to have problems with inflation or even hyperinflation. Uh, U.S. markets still looking super strong. Not only did we have uh, pending home sales tick up yesterday, we had new house builds pick up, and this is due to the lower uh, mortgage rates. Here's a piece from Jim Bianco uh, talking about uh, U.S. rates being too high. And if we scroll down, uh, we can see that Percentage of countries with long-term yields below the United States, and it is at 100%. So, hey, Tom, how's it going? Uh, so right now, uh, it's more expensive for U.S. companies to get uh, debt than, than any other country. Now, the top tier, the investment-grade companies like Microsoft, Apple, they can go borrow money in foreign currencies and sidestep this, but the smaller companies are the ones that are having trouble uh, competing in terms of financing with the rest of the world, uh, which further pushes this, uh, this mindset that the Fed will continue to lower rates. So much discussion of repo, so little discussion that the U.S. government is on pace to issue $11.3 trillion of treasuries this year, with 55% of that in six-month or less tenors. Uh, so that's a huge supply of bonds hitting the market, which also makes me think the Fed must start increasing their balance sheet uh, to take a lot of pressure off of this bond market. $190 billion total in overnight repo money. Some of it's at a 14-day term. The rest is at a 60-day, or rather, <clears throat> overnight rate. 
Now this is essentially the same thing as adding to the balance sheet. Uh, of course it's just short term lending but this is a huge cash uh, surplus. Now they're saying it's not enough that they're going to need more like 400 billion dollars added. I like uh, watching this guy. I've actually had a few chats with him on Twitter. He manages a $4 billion fund, used to work for Ray Dalio, has a lot of great insights. Next two months are critical for the outlook. If we continue to weaken, I'll slowly drift into the recession camp. If we bounce, I think we just saw the nadir in activity. My gut says this is mostly due to a red hot 2018, but enduring Chinese weakness leaves me nervous. Uh, good news on the repo madness. They did double the available uh, amount of uh, cash that can be borrowed overnight. And for the first time, it was not oversubscribed. You can see in the red line the demand uh, and the green line the available. So for the first time, the demand was less than the available. We'll see if that uh, continues or not. Joe Gagnon and Brian Sack, these are ex-Fed folks, say the Fed needs to expand their balance sheet by $250 billion to fix the repo market. To date, they've only expanded it by $190 billion, so they're still short. Uh, some interesting Bloomberg info that came out this morning talking about the Democrats are pushing the impeachment process uh, a little bit harder today. And then they have this big piece talking about who cares if the Fed expands their balance sheet, doesn't take any money away from you, uh, which is a ridiculous statement. Obviously, the more money the Fed prints, the less valuable the dollar is, and it's stealing from the savings uh, of everyone. So that's a load of bogusness, but uh, interesting to see the various biasnesses in these different news outlets. China's Ministry of Commerce says the U.S. is in close contact to make preparations for senior level trade talks. Uh, but just yesterday, Trump continued to say he will not take a bad trade deal. So if he's not willing to take a trade deal uh, with accepting uh, agricultural purchases and then perhaps delaying the December tariffs, things can get quite nasty very quickly. So that's why it's important that you have your TLT position. I think that there's a good chance with all the political heat uh, that we do get an agricultural deal and potentially uh, delay the restrictions on Huawei and on the December tariffs. And if we do not, then I would look out below on world equities and our gold and TLT position is going to really uh, kick into full gear for us. So we're in a point where uh, we need to leave our spy and TLT collars loose so that we can profit from uh, either good news or bad news on these two fronts, the impeachment and the China trade deal, uh, which I'm thinking the impeachment noise will go away here, but it uh, clearly has not yet, so we're keeping a close eye on that. Now, China has bought some food, so that's a good sign of goodwill, and of course they're fighting uh, I think because of the massive pollution that China has, they have uh, pretty much decimated their uh, pig supply with African swine. They've supposedly frozen huge amounts of pork uh, to protect themselves against a trade war, and their prices are surging up 50% a year. That's their favorite food, uh, so it's no surprise that they uh, want to buy some f agricultural products. Kyle Bass, the Hong Kong exchange bid for the London Stock Exchange is rooted in the fact that the London Stock Exchange owns the FTSC indices. Chinese bonds aren't currently in the FTSC. That crafty, the crafty Chinese are thinking that a $39 billion bid for the exchange can net them $200 billion in capital flows once they force inclusion. Now, London Stock Exchange turned that down quickly. Uh, is somewhat old news. In my meetings with members of the U.S. Congress over the past few days, something strange is happening. Jiang Feng, former head of the Chinese SEC and now head of the Shanghai Stock, has been making rounds in D.C. telling congressmen the Chinese companies don't need audits because all Chinese company data 
is a national secret. The MSCI has been cajoled into forcing U.S. investors to funnel hundreds of billions of U.S. dollar investments into Chinese companies that don't adhere to basic U.S. security laws when confronted with the fact that we demand audits. Now, this is the big risk to the banking system as they are in cahoots with China in a big way. Hong Kong police officers warn they might have to kill someone as violence escalates. This has been their plan all along as we approach October 1st for the CCP's anniversary. Xi's heavy hand will have to murder some of the good people. They're talking about... Re Looks like they're actually trying to provocate China to repeat the Tiananmen Square uh, massacre in Hong Kong. And things continue to get worse and worse week after week, even after they said they would remove the extradition bill. They have seven points they want, and this continues to uh, add tensions to the markets. We'll see uh, just how nasty it gets this weekend uh, ahead of the official start of their anniversary. <clears throat> this is a bunch of children of Muslim Chinese who were taken away from their parents uh, and crying on this clip while the parents are in these re-education camps. Uh, so this could be another political point the U.S. makes to apply uh, pressure on China. I watched a really interesting thing from C CSIS. Uh, where they did a war game with U.S.-China trade war uh, several times, and they're talking about uh, exactly what strategies would be used. And in most of their outcomes, they, they actually ended up with a stalemate. They couldn't get the Chinese to really change much. And so instead, it turned into uh, more like, how can we make sure that uh, the U.S. remains a more efficient economy? And what pressures can we put on China to slow them down? And uh, what we haven't really seen the U.S. do is try to go get a coalition of allies to support it in this endeavor to, uh, to fight back against China. And one of the reasons why is because the Chinese have so much pol uh, financial power over uh, really our European allies in terms of just doing a lot of business with Germany and other parts of Europe. So it's questionable, but perhaps this... Uh, this little aspect could be the, uh, the worldwide coalition against uh, mistreatment to, to people in China. Uh, so carefully watching the tensions with China either break down or have a period of peace here. Goldman cuts its loans exposure to SoftBank. This is a huge bank that's been continually re-leveraging itself and uh, perhaps is one of the banks that is creating such a draw on the repo market right now. I'm also looking at HSBC, Deutsche Bank, and the Bank of China. Uh, it's really not clear what's creating the dollar shortage in the repo market or why the U.S. banks that do have cash are not willing to loan uh, to these foreign banks that are trying to come in and borrow uh, overnight. President Trump says China wants to make a deal. However, the real question is, do we want to make a deal? Um, <clears throat> so very hard to predict what's going to happen there. China wants to make a deal due to losing jobs, supply chains going down, companies moving out of China. So we're seeing companies move to Vietnam and Taiwan right now. Uh, and I've definitely been, and also to India. We saw Apple move some production to Austin, Texas. And so it's, it's really a multiplying effect. Uh, one manufacturing job for China uh, creates income, and that person can now go buy lots of stuff, which creates more jobs. So this impact of getting companies to leave China could really cripple their economy. And we're seeing that in Germ Germany's numbers. Uh, China's debt has 40% of issuers in dollar bonds due in 2020. So they are going to really, really need access to dollars in the next year. And we've seen their treasury reserves dramatically falling in the last, uh, since this trade war begun. <clears throat> okay, now I have some info on the impeachment and the political race. 
Despite rampant impeachment talk, Trump is still trading in the low 40s like he was before starting this. Not much change. Note the volume is a record, so traders are exchanging lots of money on this market, and it's not really moving. You can see the uh, betting market for the U.S. election, whether Trump wins or not. And meanwhile, the latest fiasco has really put a dent on Biden and pretty much secured Warren Elizabeth's uh, or Elizabeth Warren's spot as the Democratic nominee. So that'll be interesting. According to Rudy Giuliani, he actually tried to make all this impeachment noise occur. We'll see what comes of it. Uh, definitely, it's all coming out right now. One issue with the whistleblower complaint is that they say they were not a witness. It looks like the primary complaint of the whistleblower was seeing a trend of the administration taking the notes, the memorandums of the calls and moving them to a different location. Uh, so still trying to get uh, into what exactly, it is an anonymous whistleblower once again. So curious to see what comes of that, keeping a close eye on it. Democrats are trying to destroy the Republican Party and all that it stands for. Stick together. Trump tweet. Here's a look at the SPY. And again, it's ready to bust past this $300 level simply because the rest of the world is printing money, lowering rates, going into negative yielding bonds. Uh, and there's really just nowhere else to invest. The U.S. is still reporting great earnings. We are creating nice fat deficits with the government, which helps keep the uh, keeps all the GDP numbers strong and because the rest of the world is being reckless with their government debt and monetary policy it's allowing us to continue to do the same as well uh, so I still expect uh, as long as the trade war has a period of truce and the impeachment story doesn't get out of control that we are on track for the spy to break beyond 300 finally uh, at the same time, we have our Fed lowering rates and ready to most likely start up QE in November. Now, the nice thing about playing the bond market is they do leak what they're going to do uh, ahead of their meetings. So it's quite a fiasco that they do this. Of course, the Fed uh, says they have one mandate, but clearly their goal is to protect the banks. And so <clears throat> with nowhere else to invest... Money flowing at rapid pace and from the printing presses, bonds that are going to get relieved from central banks most likely in the next several months. I believe there's going to be massive flow into the spy. Uh, and again, that is the caveat that there is a truce in the trade war and uh, this political chaos dies down. So at this point, we're still playing to the upside on the spy and... Um, Here's a look at the one month chart on it. We've been playing the bullish side of the SPY since 282, racked up some nice profits. And I was expecting as of last week when the Fed did do what we expected that we'd be able to uh, break above 300 this week, but then all the political turmoil hit the markets. TLT continues to be very profitable for us this year, quite a rally and I believe uh, because of what the rest of the central banks are doing, we can count on this to, uh, to travel higher. They have to keep these spreads uh, between U.S. rates and other world rates relatively close. Uh, otherwise, it can create a lot of chaos in the credit market. So I think they really have no choice but to follow the pack and continue to lower rates and start up QE, especially when we look at that $11 trillion of new notes coming through this year. GDX is the gold miner ETF. This is our buy and hold position. And sure, we had a little volatility in it recently, the same with silver. Uh, but the big picture is that we're entering a period like 2008 and like 2009, but it's a little different. Now the amount of debt that we have to service is significantly higher, something like three times higher than back then. Uh, so they're going to have to print much more money than they did in the last crisis to try to uh, save the economy. Um, and it's not just the U.S. doing this. Now the big Lehman 
moment is not a U.S. bank. It's not the U.S. real estate market. The new Lehman moment is China is going to go bankrupt and cause everyone around them to go bankrupt. And so for a period of time, we're likely to see money just flow into the U.S. products as our economy uh, is not so correlated to exports. Um, so this is a great play. I intend to hold it as long as the central banks are printing money and lowering rates. And I think they will do that to try to fight off a recession, a global recession, maybe even a global depression from China finally uh, learning what happens when you misallocate funds for too long. And so the, the world has continued to lend China insane amounts of money to the point that their GDP to debt levels 300%. And now, uh, if they come to a truce with the U.S., they could probably continue to borrow more money. They have proven that they have a very successful model of building things, clearly, uh, but perhaps they just haven't been building the right things. So the, money, the world wants to bet on China if they'll play nicely. But if they won't play nicely, then it looks like they may be the... Uh, Lehman moment of 2008 and 2020. I think they are on the verge of cracking, and we can see that by looking at German's uh, PMI at 40 now. So <clears throat> clearly the banks will print money and lower rates. This is going to be extremely bullish for gold and silver. Perhaps spot gold will be stuck at this $1,500 range. Central banks know they need to load up on gold. They've been doing this for the past eight years. And they're doing it at rapid pace in uh, all of the countries where they've been devaluing their currency. They need the credibility in their banking system. They probably will put a ceiling on spot gold, but I like to look at the miners. The miners will create the new flows of gold at very high profit margins. So GDX is a great play, and I think it can go <clears throat> much higher than we saw in 2012, uh, especially if the trade war persists. So that's something to keep a close eye on uh, in terms of our buy and hold position, potentially going above 10%. Once we get a little more proof uh, that the banks will be, especially the U.S. bank, will be resuming QE. Now we have seen the uptick. Uh, we've seen them do the repo. We're seeing other Fed presidents say they need to start this. We've got Goldman Sachs coming out with a chart of exactly how much the Fed's going to print. And so... Uh, you know, they all pretend like they don't know what the Fed's going to do and put on this pony show for us. But uh, we all know the Fed is there to support the banks. And um, so love GDX. Now, the increase in price in gold has led much faster than silver. So there's a simple reversion play for silver to catch up to gold in terms of percentage of increase. And uh, if we do look at SLV in the same crisis, uh, SLV and GDX were able to predict the front, uh, they're able to predict the QE a month before it happened. And that's when we saw these start to spike. And I believe this is what silver and gold are doing right now. They've predicted QE and now it's being front run. And so this uh, SLV, which is around 17, just to get back to the peak of the last rally was at 47. So we have a huge run on SLV potentially ahead that lasted two years last time. <clears throat> we'll see how long the banks can get away with printing money. Uh, now the joke is that they do QE and flood the banks with money. They let the banks take profits on all their malinvestment at the cost of all the citizens who have savings. And so uh, maybe, maybe at most 10% of QE actually makes it to the people and to the small businesses. Uh, the rest of it, 90% stays in Wall Street and inflates the value of assets. And so there's more and more people who want to uh, create QE that goes to the people and works its way up the system. So uh, the catch with the top-down perspective is that we get inflation in assets like stocks, real estate, bonds, uh, and very little uh, inflation uh, from actual purchases of goods, which is what the Fed says they're actually trying to do. Now, if you go give all the people money, 
directly, uh, th which is growing in support worldwide, then certainly you're going to see instant inflation. Uh, so it'll be curious to see just exactly if that happens and when it happens. Uh, but I think it is quite in the books because we've proven that if you just give the banks the money, it just feeds Wall Street. Uh, whereas if we were to reverse that. Now, the other question is if you feed money from the bottom up, will it make people lazy? Uh, or <laughs> if you're getting, a, you know, like Andrew Yang says, let's give everybody a thousand bucks a month. You know, is that going to help spur economic activity and production? Or is it going to make people lazy? Hard to, uh, it's hard to say <clears throat> what the result of that would be. So our silver position's down a little bit from Tuesday, uh, but again, I am not worried about that. We're gonna see volatility in these very uh, relatively smaller asset classes. Uh, so silver is much smaller than gold, gold's much smaller than equities, equities is much smaller uh, than bonds, and bonds are much smaller than the currency market. IWM is the Russell 2000, Stanley Drunkenmiller's favorite uh, measurement of the health of the stock market. This is the 2000 index of companies in the U.S. And it's looking pretty strong. Now, once again, it's fighting this resistance level that it's had since, uh, really, since the end of 2018. And if it can break up, that would be a very bullish sign, similar to the SPY getting stuck at that $300 level. <clears throat> Emerging markets, keeping a close eye on that. This is primarily China and its trading partners, and it's kind of stuck in nowhere land. If we get a China trade deal, I would quite likely switch out the Tuesday play from SLV into emerging markets, as the world would love to bet on China right now. You can see the money flowing in it uh, with those volume bars below, and uh, just to get back to its recent high is a nice 20% return for the Tuesday trade. Uh, but if things continue to escalate, then that silver play will be uh, probably a lot more profitable for us. Here's your European ETF VGK, same boat as emerging markets, very tied to China. Now, it's hard for me to become pessimistic on the U.S. equities until this ETF has a serious sell-off LQD. Uh, the higher up it is, the lower the interest rates for corporations to borrow and do, guess what, stock buybacks. So if the TLT or LQD or even HYG were to have a significant sell-off, that would indicate rising rates, which would be very trouble, troublesome for the stock market. And right now, that's just not happening. Now, we're seeing a very similar pattern on the Russell 2000 as we do in the, in the junk bond market, where it's stuck at this level for now for HYG. This is the level since 2015. Uh, it has not been able to get beyond. And so I think because of this, and back to that little piece we saw from Jim Bianco about smaller companies having trouble getting access to capital at a rate that's competitive with the world. Uh, another reason I think they have to lower rates uh, for, for a considerable amount of time. Um, but in the short three-month view, uh, even the junk bond market is looking very healthy right now. Repo madness continues to confuse the world. No one really knows which banks are in trouble here. Apparently, it's foreign banks uh, trying to get their hands on dollars, probably to make payments on bonds or debts. And uh, HSBC was rumored to have been helping control the Chinese currency exchange and potentially lost a ton of money betting down on the dollar. Um, of course, we've seen Ray Dalio and Jeffrey Gunlack, who I believe have a lot of money from China, unfortunately, uh, been predicting a huge down move on the dollar and betting up on emerging markets publicly for quite some time. Those trades have been horrendously wrong, and I believe that there's been some huge losses at HSBC. A lot of people in the top ranks have been fired, and there's a lot of drama revolving around this, uh, this huge bank right now in Europe. So keeping a close eye on that, uh, who exactly is going to go bankrupt first? Will it be China? Will it be Germany? Will it be Italy? Um, 
Will it be one of these banks over there? Deutsche Bank, perhaps. Look at that. Over the last 10 years, it's gone from 84 to 644. Incredible move. Now, Deutsche Bank has laid off most of everyone who works for it. It's been supposedly cleaning up their books. Uh, below 6 is the level many analysts say is a huge warning sign. If they went under, that could be the equivalent of trillions of dollars of systemic risk going through the credit markets. Here's my favorite trade that I have the most conviction on. Uh, the question is timing. In our boot camp program, we're going to use the futures market to do this. And uh, very simple, we want to sell the CNH with a future contract at today's rate and then buy it in the future at a discount. Now the timing is going to be wait for Trump to say trade war is escalating, we're going to go forward with tariffs and potentially raise those tariffs. The Chinese have a very predictable reaction and that is to devalue their currency to offset the uh, cost of the tariffs. They cannot afford for their exports to slow down. Again, even though it looks like their GDP at 12 trillion relative to you know the 500 billion dollar uh, deficit would seem small, but if we start to cut off their exports, uh, it's a multiplier effect. Uh, because one job in manufacturing creates an a, a employee who can go spend money and create more and more jobs. So this can become very troublesome for China. And I think that they're going to do everything they can to protect the Communist Party, number one, try to keep all of their billion point, 1.4 billion people, as many of those uh, with jobs as possible, they're going to need to keep their bond and stock market healthy at all costs because they're desperate for money and investment. And so the only thing they can really do is simply devalue their currency. So I think it's either a bank that will go out or China devaluing their currency, which creates a ripple effect that's going to create the next financial storm. Uh, and so this could probably go from 7.1 to 7.4 quite easily in the next six months uh, if the tariffs do go in place in December and if uh, the trade war escalates. So on the other hand, if the tariffs were removed and uh, we did some sort of agricultural deal, then that rate could go uh, stronger. So I'm not ready to put on that futures contract yet. This will be a trade that's only issued in our boot camp. Uh, so for those of you not in that and want to follow our trades on this one, uh, again, we need to be ready. We need to have our accounts approved for futures. We need to know how to sell that contract and be ready. We're going to recommend one contract per $100,000 in the portfolio with a target gain of about 4% total return on the portfolio. And again, we know the catalyst is going to be a Trump tweet saying tariffs are going up. If you've been doing this trade since 2018, you've made a killing on it as they've been dramatically devaluing their currency. Meanwhile, Japan's currency is weakening against the dollar. The euro is in a serious mess. I can remember when the euro used to be worth a lot more than a dollar. At this rate, the euro is going to be worth less than a dollar. And uh, with Christine Lagarde now in the seat, that's almost guaranteed. She loves to print. German yield flirting with sub-zero on the 30-year bond. Absolute insanity. This is your key indicator to judge the health of China. Uh, clearly, they're both in some serious trouble. Here's a closer look at it in the last six months. And it's super correlated to the U.S. Treasury. They simply just want to be a few points above so that they can uh, not ruin the credit system of the world but continue to have an attractive bond yield. And Bitcoin uh, has had quite a little bit of chaos last few days. I would say it's a buying opportunity. I don't think anything is going against uh, crypto at this point. China's in a mess. People are going to be trying to get out. 
Uh, do you ever show your broker statements or portfolio PL on a consistent basis? Yeah, yeah, we'll show you. Uh, I'll show you everything that you can look at. Um, so first of all, you know, every day in the the disclaimer, we do uh, point out that this is a hypothetical model portfolio, and we're not front running our clients. Uh, but I do want to point out that in the description box, you have links to all of the trades. Uh, which are given out at a very specific time. So it's noon Eastern, Monday through Friday. And if you click on these links in here, you can actually go look at every article, uh, every trade alert, and see the screenshots. So we're not trading illiquid products, we're trading the SPY. Uh, so it's very easy for you to go uh, audit these uh, results. And uh, again, you know, we're not showing off huge returns here. We're, we're trying to achieve a 1% to 2% return. Um, so you can go click on every issue and see exactly how it works. You can see how we get into the trade. I do audit the trade for you, but you can go do that yourself. Really all you got to do is worry about the change of price of the underlying asset and the change of price of the option contract. Um, so you can go click on this. There's also a link to the track record. Uh, the track record is organized in such a way that you can see every single trade organized per portfolio. Uh, but again, you have two things. You have the screenshots uh, publicly available that's not protected by some password membership site. Uh, so there's uh, really complete transparency here. Um, so here's your different portfolios. We have a summary. You can see how each portfolio has returned individually month over month. The starting balances and ending balances. You can see all the stock trades, all of the in the purple here. Option selling is in this pink area where we have open and closed. And again, our members do get a copy of the spreadsheet to manage their own trades. And then over here we have our closed long options. This is most, mostly our protection to the downside. And again, uh, you can see each tab organized very clearly here. Uh, so you can see the complete history of each portfolio. Let me see where my chat box went so I can see if there's any more questions. So yeah, you can go audit all this uh, as much as you want on your own time for sure. There's every trade alert that's ever been issued is publicly available right in the description box, organized per portfolio. You have access to the track record. And uh, if you do join our live webinar, you can talk to other members. We have a very high success rate. And that's because the program is, uh, number one, we're not trying to hit huge returns, which in the long run usually loses. We're going for very safe, small returns. And uh, we have very predictable program. You know exactly what we're going to trade, when we're going to trade it, and how we're going to trade it. So the, really the only changes are the strikes on our protection. So uh, that's with the options. Now we do have a live webinar starting in five minutes. So I'm going to wrap today's live stream up. If you don't want to miss out on tomorrow's trade alert, definitely call Dean so we can activate your account and get you started, 505-322-7515. Thank you guys, I would keep going a little longer today, but we have our webinar coming up in a few minutes, so thanks.